This video is sponsored by Vezi. The strange and startling world of Gemini Home Entertainment lulls us in with its humble beginnings as we're greeted with a heartwarming hug by a Bob Ross inspired educational video on the world's weirdest animals. Yet, it quickly devolves into a happy accident, let's say, as we're confronted by an insidious undercurrent of mysterious it-inspired deadlights, body-snatching aliens, campfire cryptoids, perhaps the men in black, a deadly disease, and finally, planet-eating planets. Yeah, bet you didn't see that one coming. Thanks for recommending this one, folks. To call Gemini Home Entertainment simply another analog horror does a massive disservice to the increasingly grander and brooding concepts it dwells on. But without ever losing touch of its eerie, intimate roots, a line you'll later come to realize is actually a pretty good pun. If I was to throw you my quick elevator pitch, it's basically a mixture of Mark Frost and David Lynch's Twin Peaks, 1978's The Invasion of the Boss, Body Snatchers, and Lovecraft's The Colour from Outer Space, in that it maintains this homegrown, small town relatable feel, as the more eccentric, surrealist, dreamlike, and eventually otherworldly elements slowly and quietly invade their way into each video, both subtextually and quite literally. Created by Remy Abode in 2019, Gemini Home Entertainment is an ongoing YouTube series consisting of currently 18 videos, give or take, that at first appear independent of each other, as they range from PSAs to instructional videos to infomercials that occasionally incorporate haunting found footage. However, as the series progresses, you'll start to see the pieces fit together as the videos interconnect a series of plot threads that initially build from an alien invasion to what I think is a cosmic deity masquerading as an all-seeing, all-knowing planet. Hopefully, throughout the video I can make sense of some of the madness for first-time viewers, but I need to clarify a few things before we truly begin. If you saw my video on the backrooms, you'll know I'm not one to keep up with internet trends, and so naturally as I start to cover more internet and analog horror, I'll forever be late to the party when there's likely dozens of two-hour plus deep dive videos already out there. I myself have not read any theories, comments, or watched any breakdown videos on Gemini because I just do not have the time to engage in it as deeply as others, so this isn't obviously going to be an explanation video. All the power to you if you love that, but if you want long-winded answers, I recommend you seek elsewhere, because I'm long past my Papa Sylvia days. I'm much more curious in exploring just what exactly makes it so uniquely scary, so true to my style of stream of consciousness criticism, if you're interested in listening to me personally ramble about Gemini sheer brilliance at inducing fear and audible gasps thanks to its exceptional delivery, well, let's look at the internet's most terrifying cosmic horror. Of course, as always, please leave your thoughts, theories, and recommendations in the comments below, including a cheeky wee like and subscribe if you can, and lastly, here are a few words from this video sponsor, Vezi. I've been on my feet constantly this past month, from grocery shopping, to meetings all over town, to standing and talking for several hours at a time, and before wearing Vezis, I hated the gross sweaty socks, the awful shooter, and just the perpetual feeling like I was wearing heavy cinder blocks on my feet, like seriously. Seriously, my toes and feet arches used to suffer without Vezi footwear. For a good while now, I've been switching between Vezi weekend shoes and everyday move shoes, and let me tell you, they're a miracle. Thanks to their four-way stretch material that not only makes them slip on and off and perfectly fitting without ever needing to adjust or tighten the laces, but they have a remarkably lightweight comfort that's honestly better than any pair of slippers I've ever owned, and that's without sacrificing stability or durability. See, these weekend shoes, I've owned them for years now, still the sturdiest and most reliable puppies I own, not a wet sock once. And that's because Vezi's coating is 100% waterproof and uses Dymatex technology to ensure constant breathability, especially when temperatures get warm, allowing me to just get on with what matters in life and that's living. Take advantage of Vezi's Memorial Day seal and save up to 30% on a variety of Vezi styles available at Vezi.com slash Ryan Hollinger. 
In case you missed the seal, you can still enjoy a 15% discount on your order by using the code Ryan Hollinger at checkout. Don't wait too long to grab your favourite Vezzy shoes. Gemini Home Entertainment works out at roughly 100 minutes in runtime, with each video lasting between 5 to 7 minutes, with a signature template consisting of conventional face value information that takes on an entirely new context when interrupted by warnings of the underlying threat infesting our home planet. It packs a hefty amount of storytelling into these lean, digestible, bite sized chunks that, like Key and Pixel's back rooms, do eventually make sense of their own logic and history without either holding your hand or making itself so needlessly contrived to retain relevance via theory videos. Granted, there are a few ideas and episodes that don't work for me, such as Sleep Image Visualizer and Artificial Computer Learning, where the company's name is Danger spelled backwards. The Shining is one of the only times something like that didn't come off as corny to me. I mean, there's nothing particularly wrong with those videos, I just don't care much for creepy technology or the fact that these videos do indulge more in contrivance, which isn't emotionally compelling to me. Anyway, the reason I compare Gemini to the style of Twin Peaks is because it's like watching something that's wearing a mask. Each video typically opens with a cozy, summery, late 80s, early 90s, great outdoorsy feel that makes you drop your guard before unraveling into something alien, making you reflect on everything you just witnessed. I'm going to keep repeating the absolute genius of its subversive structure because, while a bit repetitive at times, it's profoundly important to sustaining the fear and paranoia. This is obviously best introduced in the opening video, The World's Weirdest Animals, where it begins by leisurely introducing various natural wildlife before the music jarringly cuts and we're left with disquieting, palpably unnerving static. In almost an instant, the warming invite shifts to a sense of isolation and trespass, as something seems to take over the video to introduce a mysterious unseen creature known as Woodcrawlers. It cannot be understated how chilling these transitions are, as true to the form of the implied alien invasion, each jarring interception makes the videos feel sentient as they begin directly addressing the viewer as if to break the fourth wall. One way to consider it is like propaganda akin to John Carpenter's They Live. It's all smokescreen and mirrors as it tries to hide the threat behind a friendly smile, describing the woodcrawlers as nature's mockery, a theme that will persist moving forward. Unlike the other animals distinct to their regions, woodcrawlers can be found everywhere, insinuating it's already too late and the overwhelming odds are against us as these excellent hunters, as the video declares them, can tread on any terrain without making a sound, nesting themselves in the homes and subsequent bodies of innocent people. The big scare comes from the alleged fake people, local residents who have been possessed by the creatures as they try to mimic human behaviour, screaming to a multitude of influences such as the body snatchers, the thing and mimic. I covered this topic a few years back, but Gemini owes a lot to the 1978 adaptation of Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers, because that film masterfully subverted the tropes and common hysteria in alien invasion fiction by emphasising ambiguity, body horror and the human condition. Coming out of the 70s where gritty, cynical horror flicks came into effect, 1978's The Invasion of the Body Snatchers changed the original story to one that was more nihilistic, by presenting characters utterly incapable of change because ultimately what can the average person do to save the world as it were. As such, survival far outweighed fully comprehending and stopping the danger, as it basically became survival of the fit or more appropriately, the luckiest, with the futile climax seeing our protagonist try to cause some intervention, but it changes nothing. What sticks with you is how lesser and lesser humanity becomes in the eyes of their emotionless threat, as it becomes a greater and more tangible presence as events go on. In Gemini, part of that slow takeover is seen in the specific choice of words that influence your reading of the information on screen. For example, 
episode 2 by Harbinger Technologies introduces us to storm safety and how we can prepare and handle the inevitable, yet subtextually the language also applies to surviving the woodcrawlers as some alarming subtleties stand out, such as when the storm approaches, quietly take your family to the bunker, your home does not belong to you now. More and more, the formal presentation of the videos turns personal and dare I say, fittingly condescending. By the end, a vivid stark statement is made clear in the minds of the audience that is inescapable throughout all of Gemini home entertainment videos. Something is coming and it's not pleasant, nor does it give a damn about your feelings. As episode 2 progresses, we see woodcrawlers as sentient lights in the field that can burrow below the house, but like Twin Peaks, I love how it effectively balances the fear alongside humour. Remain calm, your tears are filled with salt. That is chef's kiss such a beautiful quote and I want that on a t-shirt. In fact, Oh, that's a shame. As I said, there is a feeling of mockery that persists throughout the series, as it taps into the cosmic vibe of having our insignificance and futility literally looked down on by something greater than us, which is brought to life in episode 4 when we're elevated to space. Like with Weirdest Animals, our solar system begins as an educational video explaining various planets along with an ethereal music score, but the tone of the writing quickly begins to read somewhat nihilistically. After the impressively imposing descriptions of three scorching planets, the Sun, Mercury and Venus, it distinctly downplays Earth as a pitiful miracle it can even support life given how it's 71% water and vulnerable to extinction if the sun were to die out, let alone the pieces of Mars that fall to Earth via meteorites. You'll sense the feeling of mockery again as Earth is followed by the barren desert of Mars, a description that reflects what Earth would become without the sun, a barren frozen rock to be exact. Whatever speaking to us sees us as nothing more than a blot in our solar system, existing until its inevitable burnout. We can theorise that the meteorites from Mars are how the woodcrawlers made it to Earth, again described in Weirdest Animals as nature's mockery, and the reason I came to that assumption was oddly because it reminded me of the story in Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. This will make greater sense in Episode 10, Advanced Mining Vehicle, but for context in advance to where this is all going, in the 2001 Final Fantasy film which I covered just over a year ago, the story goes that Earth is invaded by alien phantoms that consume human spirits after after their planet was annihilated and caused meteorites containing their spirits to crash onto Earth. The main theme of the film revolves around the philosophy of Gaia, which is this idea that the Earth is a living, breathing organism, and everything on it, both biological and not, functions with the purpose of keeping the Gaia alive, similar to the human body. Episode 4 pushes across the notion that these planets are basically alive. Not in a metaphysical sense, but in an actual sense. They are more or less creatures, entities conscious of their existence, and thus the solar system is essentially a food chain of sorts. This is further and urgently highlighted when we learn that the red spot on Jupiter is actually an open fucking wound, suggesting something is trying to attack and even devour these planets, as Neptune has seemingly mutated, whatever the fuck that means for now, and moving towards Saturn to spread some sort of disease. All of this serves to reveal the true antagonist of Gemini, the Iris, an omnipotent eye slowly consuming the solar system, at least in my perspective. This discovery completely overhauled my expectations. I really thought Gemini would be more simplistic than a deity pretending to be a planet watching over us. Usually, with intimate horrors that expand into something grander, I would begin to check out because it typically feels contrived, but the logic of the story does remain largely consistent going forward. In episode 5, we start to see the world become fully realised through Moonlight Arch's family camp established in 1930, where it humorously calls back to episode 2's storm video by presenting cabins that are now burrow free and updated with modern technology, along with references to both the planet drama and woodcrawler's deadlights via 
via the Lights in the Sky event. At this point, there is a sense of acceptance that maybe this place has adjusted to its invaders and we have to learn to live with them. I see them less as predators and more as creatures simply trying to survive in what to them is a hostile planet they had no choice but to escape to. However, the concept of the Woodcrawlers grows extremely harrowing in Episode 7's Wilderness Survival Guide, where the creatures take on traits straight out of Annihilation, as aside from taking over the bodies of other animals, the woodcrawlers can use human screams for help to bait victims towards them. This shot is the best and most profoundly distressing moment in all of Gemini. Just the uncanny stance of a fake person staring directly into your soul, hoping you come closer towards it, and watching it walk away like a puppet on strings truly solidifies the sheer terror of the series. This is solidified further in Episode 9, Games for Kids, where it continues to stress this overarching theme of humans lowering to the bottom of the galactic food chain, as we don't have to work hard to apply the subtext to what games like Hide and Seek and Tag mean against the creatures. I'm not going to run through the specifics, because the brilliance of it is that you're so conditioned by this point to reading between the lines, it's too obvious to point it out. But you can see how Gemini is chipping away at our place in nature, and and exposing how utterly vulnerable we are to a species that's perfectly adapted to a land that's supposed to be familiar to us. Usually horror puts victims in places they don't know to make them feel lost and alone, but it's more telling when our home, our place of safety and sanctuary, has become the most dangerous place to us. Even calling upon social fears embedded deep within the home invasion subgenre, which literally has its own video targeted towards the woodcrawl Although, can I just say, on the Games for Kids video, I hate static images like this because I remember watching Flash videos when I was a kid and you were supposed to spot the difference or something like that, and then a big ass scary face would jump up, so of course, during this, I was hiding in the comment section. However, the big shock comes in the ending when a game called Feed the Forest is shown, where kids are told to sneak into the forest at night with their friends and scream as loud as they can, and the game ends when the forest is fed. At at this point, we're seeing the entity that intrudes the tapes trying to manipulate the viewer with little effort, and that's because the creatures are less and less worried about hiding. They're growing confident and fearless of humans because we're simply showing passivity, no willingness or effort to fight back. Like the grimness of the food chain, we're animals in a pen, ignorant to the slaughter, as depicted in episode 5, where multiple victims are shown to answer a mysterious knock at a cabin, we're told to simply ignore. Or... That's what intensifies the latter half of the series. Usually I don't like when fiction does this, but it actually works here. The creatures become less subtle as things go on when they realize how vulnerable humans can be. The early videos imply that it's already too late and these creatures have claimed the earth for themselves, so all we can do is adjust to this new apex wildlife sitting out there in the forest, because true to natural horror, you cannot control the wild. This lack of true power and control takes us back to the cosmic horror, where episode 10 sees the Northern Alberta Mining and Development Company send a drone beneath the ground to discover literal veins and bone-like surfaces, thus the theory that the planets are living, breathing entities similar to the concept of Gaia. This video is another pure masterclass in suspense, sound, and visual design. The pyramid tried to do a similar thing on a budget of $6.5 million, but right here is the effect of absolute talent money cannot buy. It's amazing how it makes the ground beneath our feet feel like another dimension entirely. Suddenly, the very ground that we stand on, like the Borderlands, is a threat to us. We've basically become a flea on the crust of a living entity. It's later confirmed that the Woodcrawlers are tending to this garden as a mutation similar to Neptune spreads its way through Earth, explained in the next video as Deep Root Disease, which disturbs can also infect humans, insinuating that Iris draws closer and the end is seemingly near. The best way I can explain the horror of Deep Root Disease is to compare it to Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space, in that it physically manifests over every living and non-living thing in its path, 
including the tapes themselves, thus making Iris a tangible parasite looking to control and spread its influence. I did a video on it before, but for context, The Color Out of Space tells a story of a meteorite that crashes to Earth and unleashes a mysterious color that could be interpreted as a virus, disease, mutation, or an actual alien itself, as it deforms and erodes everything around it and even causing humans to go insane. After the events came to an abrupt end, the land became known as the Blasted Heath. In response to all the decayed wilderness after the strange colour simply left, leaving it not far off the description of an open wound mentioned in the Solar System episode of Gemini. The key aspect of the horror in Colour Out of Space comes purely from the fact we never learn what the hell the colour actually is. It seems to exist simply to annihilate without reason and leave when it gets bored. In Gemini, we're being contacted by something that relishes in our inability to decipher it, even in the meta sense of you and I trying to understand this series for ourselves. It gets pleasure from the fact we're sitting ducks on this planet, with monthly progress reports suggesting that it transmits its disease, whether it be figuratively or literally, through an AI program. This is what I mean when I say I didn't really vibe with the techno horror stuff, it's a lot to take on top of the more extraordinary natural horror. Horror. Sticking with natural horror, I was fine with my theory that the videotapes made by this charming production company were infected by Iris and nothing more, because visually and subtextually it links with the idea of innocuous innocent creatures being deformed and mutated by something that seeks to devour and destroy harmony for no reason, as opposed to all this AI BS to add unneeded depth. I think the raw simplicity of these images of the deep root disease spreading on technology is enough to sell the existential Cronenbergian premise that everything on Earth is a living, breathing entity capable of being taken control of by something omnipotent like Iris. This finally leads us to the Christmas Eve party where we see the woodcrawlers on relatively full display, which is done well, but honestly, it does start to show the limitations in the visual effects. And that's me being nitpicky because when everything is already at such a high technical and artistic level, blotches become unfairly noticeable. More so, by this point, Gemini was starting to wear out its welcome for me, and I'm glad it more or less comes to an end after this, as we have two more main series videos and then these two current library videos which I view as supplements for those looking for more body horror and creature feature goodness. Home Invasion brings the horror of the woodcrawlers to a bone-chilling conclusion by using fine footage to show victims of the deep root disease before being attacked by a creature leaving us with a powerful lasting image. Personally, I can take or leave the disease aspect as I think the woodcrawlers are terrifying enough on their own, but I respect Gemini brings its concepts to a cohesive enough conclusion, with a probe mission throughout the solar system revealing the dramatic extent of how the universe has changed since the humble beginnings of the series. Similar to what the woodcrawlers and disease has done to our natural land, the solar system has become fully deformed. Now, it does try to tie all the technological stuff into this premise of Iris journeying through the conscious mind or whatever, but the more you try to explain that, the less frightening and frankly less interesting it becomes. So if this series can easily retcon information like this mysterious ocean video that was removed, I can retcon what I want because what is canon on the internet these days? To conclude my ramblings, I say this all the time, but embracing the mystery as it is without having to do homework, I like the vibe of a cosmic horror that alludes to the theory of Gaia that planets and everything on them, both organic and artificial, all live, breathe and interconnect, thus creating an overwhelming existential anxiety of the universe being this one colossal labyrinth that connects us to everything. The question that's unanswered is where it all came from. Symbolic of the great outdoorsy natural setting, is what's happening actually natural? and organic, or is it in fact an AI-like universe created by an entity entirely for its own pleasure? I've heard the prevailing theory that Gemini is about the end of the world, and I'm sure many deep dive videos give a complex answer to this, but at the true heart of cosmic horror is how insignificant our might-like presence is in the galaxy and beyond. When you think about it in the eye of Iris, an entity with no need to explain itself, 
Your answers and purpose mean nothing to it. We're nothing more than a speck in its sandbox. Thank you.